We talk about the inner healing intelligence or the inner healer. And I believe that's true. And my tradition, I think I would call it the Atman. It is the soul. It is our soul that is divinely attuned for peace, joy, and freedom. And if I just let it do its work, it knows way faster how to get this work done than I do. The amazing thing about the mushrooms is that they speak. They talk to you. They will answer questions, carry on conversations. Psilocybin just pulls up a chair on the porch and puts its feet up. Oh, what's up, everybody? Yo, Connor, go ahead and just keep it going for me squatting down. Just let them see. Everybody know I'm showing up to work when I don't fucking feel like it. Honestly, I am. Whew, I'm in a lot of pain, for one, and I'm <laughs> really frustrated. Um, last episode came out. There was like three or four days that it was up without any audio. Um, somehow, I take full responsibility for that. It was. It's. It's. To me, it's rather embarrassing um, because I am really, 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 really bent on bringing you all something that is really well done, that is really unique, and really psychedelic. Uh, and right now, the really psychedelic, and maybe really unique part about it at the moment is that uh, I'm just sitting down here being fucking real with y'all right now about all that. Because what I want to communicate in this is that um, whew, I know a lot of y'all that, that listen are part of the sanctuary community or folks that I've known over the years personally. Uh, you know, say so you can have like a thousand people in your <laughs> personal Rolodex and feel sane and feel like you've got a decent connection within that group. Um, and there's certainly a thousand people out there that I I uh, love deeply. I don't know that a thousand of you are listening to this. I wouldn't expect that. Um, but for those of you that are, I want to communicate to you and to those that I don't know personally. This is an interesting thing that I've been learning more as time has gone on in community building is that even though I might not know you personally, I still consider you part of my community. And that's really powerful. And it's something that I... Just making sure I was actually recording there. Whew, these things, I tell you. One man, not a one man band. There's so many wonderful people helping me, but right now it's just me. And so, in, the, in this moment, me and you. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, this is really interesting and unique for me. Um, feeling that sense of community that expands beyond people that I personally know. Um, I know so many people that I don't know personally have touched me and taught me and been really, really important to me and for me. Um, and I recognize that that's possible with me too. You know, and I was listening to this really wonderful podcast that my wife sent me last night um, on overcoming fear and all that stuff. And, and uh, one of the big takeaways that I got from listening to that um Aside from this kind of, you know, recognizing releasing fear, I'm afraid to be seen. I'm afraid for millions of people to be looking at me. I really am. I have been, and I'm letting go of that. Uh, letting go of that now. I might get a million people looking at this, and you know what? Let me just imagine that for a second. Hey, thank you for being here. Wow, a million people actually are interested enough in what I'm doing to show up, even if just for a minute. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's really awesome. Anyway, uh, the other aspect of that, which I got off track now, um, was, uh, oh, the realization that we might be the answer to someone's prayer. Someone may really, really feel empowered, feel seen, understood, um, a lot of wonderful feelings, loved. Uh, from experiencing someone that they don't actually know. So if I could be the answer to someone's prayer in any way, and I think and I can recognize that I have been, which is really nice. Didn't really sit with that yet. 
Um, I already have been the answer to many people's prayers, and many people have been the answer to mine. And so if this is one of those moments for you, then great. Um, maybe you've been praying about your relationship with religion. All right, so this is the first chapter, full-on chapter. We went through a little intro, a couple of, couple of uh, interviews there. Uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Go back and listen if you haven't. Oh, good coffee. And uh, first chapter that I wanted to really expand on was, well, I'm still understanding how I wanted to find these chapters or, or structure these chapters. So again, work in progress right before your eyes. And, uh, you know, I started out just with a general curiosity on what perspectives there were to be encountered around spirituality versus religion. And spoke with several folks who are in psychedelic religions uh, or who have an experience with psychedelics and are religious. Um, and while I didn't narrow down like a boilerplate of questions to ask each individual, um, I feel like there is, there's, there's definitely a thread there of direct experience. Um, which seems to be, as I continue to explore this idea of religion, it's like just because I started a, quote, religion or a church, I don't know if it did, did sang is sanctuary a religion, you know, or is it psychedelic spirituality that is the religion? That's probably more of the, of the, truth. But anyway, I wrote quite an introduction here that I want to just read and, and go through because it put together some thoughts um, around, first of all, you know, what psychedelic churches are presenting like. Uh, that's definitely an important part of this uh, chapter. And um, then also, like, what does the federal government recognize as a church, right? Because you and I can talk and theorize on what a church is all we want, but particularly with psychedelic church, uh, you better <laughs> you better have some quantifiable standards, uh, measures that you can uh, compare yourself to, because it's it's very likely that you will be going to court. I mean, some some of us are going to right. That's just the way it is. Somebody's gonna have to take this um, to the courts, and there's been a number of those that have. A number are in right now. Honestly, I wrote this so long ago, I can't remember if I mentioned Joe DeFore and the Eagle and the Condor. Um, and I don't think they had gotten their here their ruling um, when I wrote this, actually. Uh, and I am way behind, so I gotta work with what I got right now. We're gonna come back to religion. We're gonna get more focused and more drilled down. It'll be, who knows, six, eight, 12 months down the road, maybe two years, whatever. I don't know, there's all kinds of things. Anyway, jump into this, and then we're gonna hop right into a recording with my good friend GV. I hope you enjoy these conversations, and I'll see you on the other side of the mushroom. <laughs> all right, again. I did mention sanctuary, but I am not representing sanctuary in any of these conversations or in this little, well, my, this rather long monologue. Again, also, you can fast forward. You don't have to listen to me talk. I should have said that at the start, <laughs> but you already know that. Anyway, man is a religious animal. He is the only religious animal. He is the only animal that has the true religion, several of them. He is the only animal that loves his neighbor as himself and cuts his throat if his theology isn't straight. Mark Twain. <laughs> I grew up and currently live in a state where rattlesnake handling churches still exist. They weren't nearly as prevalent as other Christian denominations, but for a good while there, they were more accessible than, say, an Islamic temple. Uh, they also wouldn't have been as controversial as an Islamic temple when I was a kid either. Uh, but, you know, change comes even here in the great backward state of Kentucky. Now, you can still find rattlesnake religions, uh, but not here in the big city. Uh, there have been in, in Appalachia, uh, and you can bet that every Sunday, some folks of faith risk, risk life and limb to prove their devotion 
to the Lord. Understandably, some of you might think this is a joke. You might not even be able to fathom what I'm describing, but I assure, assure you it is a practice and certainly one of faith, if also some foolishness. You may also be wondering, how can this be legal? Are there children there? Do people get hurt? Well, in short, no, it's not legal. And yes, there are children there. And of course, people get hurt and die. Far more people than have died from psilocybin mushrooms. Did you know that there are no deaths that can be attributed to psilocybin toxicity? There are, two are, there are two suspicious accounts, one that relates a young man who over the course of an entire day picking wild liberty caps, Psilocybe similenciata, in the UK, allegedly ingested something like 150 mushrooms. They're small, but potent, and reportedly suffered cardiac arrest. There has never been a decisive conclusion that confirms this suspicion, but even I will tell you that is way too many mushrooms. The other tragic account is a child that consumed wild mushrooms and met an unfortunate end. In the lawn where he was found eating the mushrooms, there were wood-dwelling psilocybes. Growing in the same lawn, in close proximity to these magic mushrooms were also gal Gallerina species, small brown mushrooms, three of which could easily kill an adult, much less a child. Again, evidence inconclusive. So, what does this talk of poison and perishing have to do with mushrooms, or mushroom churches, or psychedelic churches, or church at all? Well, in the case of the serpent sermons, the tempting of fate is seen as a sign of faith. There is some biblical quote that I won't look up right now about the faithful taking up deadly serpents and drinking poison and living that is cited as the origin of this ordination. Some sects also drink strychnine, from what I understand. Uh, to prove their faith. Now is a good time for us to all practice a non-judgmental perspective because even my bemushroom enlightened mind wants to dismiss these idiots as, oh, whoop, I did it. Say, I, they're not idiots. They just see the world through a very different lens. Besides, who am I to judge? I worship the mushroom, right? Wrong. If there's anything that I would personally like to explicitly express a misunderstanding that I could have never foreseen is this one. The mushroom is a tool. It's a gift. It's a sacrament. C.S. Lewis said the perfect church service would be the one we were almost unaware of. Our attention would have been on God. But every novelty prevents this. It fixates our attention on the service itself. And thinking about worship is a different thing than worshiping. Tis mad idolatry that makes the service greater than the God. Now, I do think there is value in the religious psychedelic community elevating what it is that is being worshipped here. Or evaluating, sorry. Evaluating what it is that's being worshipped or maybe engaged or perhaps communed with here. While I am a founding minister of Sanctuary Church, I cannot, do not, and will not speak for the beliefs of any other members. As for myself, and please let me make it abundantly clear that I worship the only nameless, formless creator from which all life springs, the source from which all being ushers forth, and for which there is no name or visage yet can be found in every atom of every thing. But it gets confusing, I know. Those of us who work regularly with the mushrooms very often speak as if the mushroom is personified. We say things like, the mushrooms told me this, or the mushrooms gave me an answer. And it certainly seems this way. After all, the title of my podcast is Psilocybin Says. And that is because it sure seems to be saying something. Psilocybin seems to have something to say about everything, actually. And without getting too much into my personal belief system, I do not believe that the mushroom is actually speaking. Perhaps it is my inner voice, my higher self. Perhaps they allow me to communicate with disincarnate entities, aliens, or with archetypes. I don't really know, to be quite honest, but I do really enjoy the conversations. So this question about a loophole, I know it's one that comes up very often. I did expect it, uh, mainly because most people out there in the world of normal only understand mushrooms to be either a recreational or therapeutic drug. And while both of these descriptions may hold water for a while, they're not the original or even, I believe, ultimate definition. 
a friend of mine who left medical school for a variety of reasons, one of which being the medicalization of psychedelics, astutely reminded me after a weekend sanctuary retreat that while many perceived groups like Sanctuary to have co-opted the mushroom from the therapeutic world, the opposite is actually true. Long, long, long before psilocybin mushrooms were touted as mental health breakthroughs or panaceas that they seem to be promoted as, it was a spiritual tool, a technology for communicating with the spirit world. It was a sacrament. There are many ancient cave paintings that illustrate mushrooms as part of shamanic rituals. There are dozens and dozens of ancient Buddhist, Hindu, and Taoist statues and effigies that depict spiritual masters with mushrooms. There are quite literally hundreds of newly discovered ancient Christian artifacts that show Jesus himself surrounded by mushrooms. Adam and Eve with mushrooms, the apostles, the ubiquitous appearance of psychedelic mushrooms, and they were absolutely psychedelic mushrooms. Some definitely distinguishable species of psilocybe and absolutely overwhelmingly depictions of Amanita muscaria. They're so prevalent that one must begin to wonder if they were deliberately withheld from modern day Christianity. Fortunately, through the work of authors like Dr. Jerry Brown, Carl Rush, Carl DeBorgi, and a few others, we have definitive proof of these archaeological gems, or perhaps anthropological, ethnomycological gems. One of my personal favorites is the oldest known baptismal font, which was found in France. It has Amanita muscaria carved, carved all along the base of the stand. But this is not common knowledge, and for many, it's a tough sale. Perhaps one of the worst outcomes of the war on drugs, aside from the thousands and thousands of lives squandered away in prison, the persecution of many good people who could have contributed meaningfully to society, fathers who should have been with their children, stolen land, property, and cash stolen by the government, and the formation of an industrial prison complex. Can you feel my anger? <laughs> I forgive him. Was the utter miseducation of the populace regarding the benefits of these illicit substances intentional? And with psilocybin, as we of course see in research from reputable universities like Johns Hopkins, but in my opinion, more importantly through archaeological artifacts crafted by everyday people, a history which spans the distance from the very inception of human civilization until now. These mushrooms have played an intrinsic and inextricable role in the development of human spirituality and therefore religion. It is my opinion that psychedelics are not the origin of religion, but that they are religion. So, the short answer as to whether psychedelic religions are a legal loophole or a workaround is an absolute no. Now, there are psychedelic churches that are using our constitutional freedoms as a loophole, yes. And I want to talk about that. Uh, understanding that I'm not doing this to spotlight, down talk, or really even criticize any one group. But as this legitimate phenomenon of psilocybin churches becomes more widespread, it seems reasonable to me that we would be having some public discourse on what legitimacy in this currently completely unregulated space looks like. I'm also not suggesting that we should be really regulating in churches, not in any official capacity anyway. My personal hope is that open dialogue would further the conversations and therefore the establishment of mushroom churches or faith-based communities that are not merely serving as ad hoc dispensaries. And there was an instance, actually an ongoing lawsuit that compelled me to present this monologue to you, my listeners. All right, again, Um, well, let's just read it. Let's just read it and see what Eric has to say. You're, you're finding out with me. How cool is that? <laughs> All right. So perhaps you have, but probably you haven't heard of Soul Tribe, a Detroit-based sacred mushroom church. 
Anyone listening who might be affiliated with Soul Tribe or their attorneys, try not to take this personally. It's, it's an exploration. My thoughts and opinions are subject to change given a solid argument and factual evidence. Feel free to present. All right, so recently, well, at this point in September of 23, shortly after the Detroit Metro Times ran a story on Soul Tribe, the church was raided. Uh, the article was titled, the article was titled, At Michigan's First Psychedelic Church and Psilocybin Mushroom Dispensary, Mushrooms are the Holy Sacrament. All right, that was the first public presentation. I'll post a link in the show notes. You can find that article online still. No one was arrested, um, but quite a large quantity of psilocybin mushrooms, capsules, and gummies were confiscated by the police. There is, of course, a backstory. Here's what I know of it. Detroit decriminalized psilocybin and other psychedelic plants in 2021. This was, in large part, a result of efforts of leaders in the BIPOC community. This I absolutely applaud. Among those proponents was Robert Schumach. The Detroit decrim bill, as with others around the country, made arrests for psychedelics the lowest priority of law enforcement, barring that they weren't being sold or caught up in other crimes. Sold or caught up. All right. Robert, shortly after the passage of this bill, began calling himself Shaman Shu. Uh, bought and renovated an old church and christened it Soul Tribes. That in and of itself, cool, no problem. Change your name, start a church, do your thing. However, not only were they selling sacrament, but Shu states in an interview, as a matter of fact, that the police confiscated $700,000 worth of sacrament. The police claimed to have pulled 100, 100 pounds of mushrooms uh, which would indicate that Shu valued his sacrament at $7,000 a pound. The police got 100 pounds of mushrooms. He said it was 700 grand, $7,000 a pound. Uh, now, back in the day, I admit, I was reluctantly involved in the black market on both ends, buying and selling, and at no time have I ever seen mushrooms go for more than two grand a pound, and but usually a 1,000 for bulk. Uh, so now I hear they're like, three, five hundred dollars for a pound of black market psilocybin. Uh, not only that, but um, Soul Tribes had billboards around town that said simply, Soul Tribes, we got the sacrament. Not only that, but there are pictures taken from Google Maps that show no less than 10, that's right, 10 of those cardboard stick out poster ground sign thingies that flat out say and this is a quote. Where'd it go? Sorry, I lost my... Oh, that's flat out give. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm confused. Like I said, we're reading the same time. <laughs> On these placards, it says, this is a quote from Robert Baker, Detroit Police... PDF, Peace Police Department on Chief of Criminal Enforcement. <laughs> the signs said, Shrooms, we deliver with a phone number right outside the church. All right. Lastly, and while I think it's worth noting that Soul Tribes is attempting to sue the city of Detroit for. Hold on. I got to take a cup. Of, I just got to take a drink. Uh, uh, this is all coming back to me. Oh my gosh. Soul Tribes is suing Detroit City for a billion dollars. A b billion, billion dollars. I got, I got it. I just got to rant. I wanted to resist. I just, but I got, this is not what we need as a standard set among psychedelic churches. Quite honestly, it pisses me off. As someone who is arrested and forced into eight weeks of house arrest and court ordered no contact with my fiance, now my beloved wife and goddess Courtney Rose, someone who is devoted no less than 25 years and certainly tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to providing access and supporting advocacy for psilocybin, as someone who has spent seven years of their life traveling to foreign countries, lugging insane amounts of equipment, coordinating employees, navigating uncharted waters, 
for psilocybin as someone who went into significant personal debt, extensive effort to establish a credible, sincere, sacred mushroom church and spiritual community that fosters peer support with low to no cost access to sacrament and sacrament support as someone who has had to fend off attack after attack from psychedelic experts who clearly weren't. It irks me to no end that anyone is going to not only assist with legitimate decriminalization effort only to defy the very standards they established by advertising and selling what they claim to consider a sacrament and to do this in a completely sacrosanct manner through billboards and placards who then attempts to use the religious liberty laws to file an egregious lawsuit for an absurd amount of money. You all are my community. This is my community. That's a horrible representation of our community. Now, Shaman Shu, we have never met. We've never even spoken. I did reach out to have you on the podcast uh, and got a strange response. Um, I do believe, though, this is a real mis misrepresentation of true psychedelic spirituality. Um, I don't want to be in attack mode. Uh, one of the great things about psychedelic churches is that they stand to collaborate much more than what's happening in the for-profit psychedelic space. There ain't no collaboration there, y'all. Quite honestly, I feel Soul Tribes is not so much as competing with other psychedelic churches, but potentially dragging them down into the muck of illegitimacy with you. That being said, I would still be interested in having you or someone from your organization on the show to discuss. Perhaps you can change my perspective. That I am always willing to do. Compare this to another psilocybin church mentioned in the same article, Oakland-based Sacred Garden that does not sell sacrament and requires prospective members to attend at least eight community events and submit themselves to a health screening before joining their entheogen community. Sacred Garden also offers trainings to become an ordained facilitator and opportunities to experience group sacred mushroom ceremonies. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then of course you know about Sanctuary. If you haven't, then whatever, check on that one too. Websites to both Sacred Garden and the other one are linked in the show notes. The reality is we don't have a lot of examples to draw comparisons from, but you can guarantee that this will be changing. There will be more psychedelic churches incorporating. And I believe there should be. I think it's a good thing. Let's just do it right. Way to go, Eagle and Condor. Joe Tafur. As I believe should be, religious organizations are not subject to discrimination or even significant scrutiny by the government, either federal or state, so long as the faith practice doesn't engender public harm. It is in your constitutional right to practice. While we don't have extensive precedent on what constitutes psychedelic church, we do have a standing acceptance as to what is a religious organization. Like it or not, these are the boundaries we are operating within. And to me, they currently seem pretty reasonable. And it doesn't seem like Soul Tribe and some others even give these requirements a once over. All right, so I'm gonna dive into those real quick here and then we're gonna move on to the interview with GV. Thank you all again. You can just fast forward right along to the interview if you like, uh, but this is just gonna be a quick overview of what the IRS um, wants to see in a church. So this is taken directly from the IRS website. That's correct. The Internal Revenue Service is the actual federal authority that has attempted to define what a church is more than any other institution within the government, especially, might I add, than the DEA, who is currently the primary overseer of psychedelic churches. Anyway, the IRS has developed a 15-point criteria to determine what constitutes a legitimate church, and here they are in order as they appear on the website with a little commentary from yours truly. All right, so one, is it a distinct legal entity? Are you registered with the government? Hmm? I'll put it in, maybe I'll put it in Kentucky terms for you. <laughs> uh, is there a recognized creed and form of worship? Basically, is there a statement of faith, right? Is there a way that people understand the, the spiritual perspective of this community? 
a definite and distinct ecclesiastical government. Does the church have a governing body? Like board of directors. A uh, formal code of conduct, conduct and discipline. So is there a code of ethics? Sanctuary has an extensive one. Is there a distinct religious history? Now, this is an interesting one. What constitutes a history? Huh? Psilocybin has been used for millennia, mainly by shamanic practitioners. Many modern psychedelic churches operate under the auspices of ONAC, the Organization of Native American Churches, but most of those practitioners are anything but Native Americans in the tr traditional sense of the word. I went to an ayahuasca church here in Kentucky, Peaceful Mountain Way. The folks that run it are sweet and sincere, but they're as white as the Alaskan snow. Okay. When we started Sanctuary, we considered opening under ONAC, but it just didn't feel sincere. So, and the basically, I left the option of starting something brand, we were left with the option of starting something brand new, and that's what we did. And yes, I do sometimes wonder if in a hundred years there will be myths created about me. Just kidding. Please, 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 please do not do to me what has been done to pretty much every other religious founder in history. Please. Okay. Moving on. Worship not associated with any other church or denomination, which is, I interpret, kind of like the ONAC thing. Does your church require you to be a member of another church in order to be a member of that church? It gets confusing pretty quickly. Organi organization of ordained ministers, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, ordained ministers selected after completing prescribed courses of study. Again, you get the picture, a seminary. Uh, literature of its own. Now, this is some gray area. Some interpret this as a like a revelatory text, like you know John Smith and the Book of Mormon, uh, or like how King James created his own ver version of the Bible when he told the Pope to go fuck himself. Uh, or our interpretation of this at Sanctuary is more like, does the church have a text that they refer to for spiritual insight and well, since I was the founding minister of Sanctuary, I chose the Tao Te Ching. Not that you care, but let me tease it out for you a little bit. If you're not familiar with the Tao Te Ching, it's an ancient Taoist text that in the very first line basically says, we don't know what the Tao is. The interpretation that we use, and there are hundreds, starts out saying, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao, which pretty much sums up not only the psychedelic experience, but the concept of God. I mean, all these churches telling us who or what God is and the truth is, and they don't have no freaking idea. We can't even conceive of eternity, the vastness of space, what was here before the Big Bang. Now they're saying it wasn't a Big Bang, it was a reverse Big Bang, and that we live inside of a black hole. Come on, there's no words. So that and the fact that the rest of the Tao is basically a treatise on paradox makes it to me the most applicable sacred text to the psychedelic experience. And it's helpful to have a guiding text some record of conversations or thoughts that have been explored these concepts before. Anyway, Tao Te Ching Sanctuary's primary sacred text, and I do, though, hope that one day we will have our own written version interpreted and with commentary, uh, perhaps, you know, psychedelic commentary. So anyway, is there an established place of worship? Where do you meet? It can be Zoom. Regular congregations, when do you meet? Regular religious services. How frequently do you get together to discuss your spirituality? It needs to be a living conversation. And Sunday schools for the religious instruction of the young. Hmm. How frequently do you get together to... Oh, I'm sorry, this one is interesting, but I guess you have to be passing on your beliefs to your children to make them viable, right? And number 15, are there schools for the preparations of its members, such as a catechism or continuing education around church doctrine? All right, so... List. So there you have it. This is what Uncle Sam, or at least his tax collectors, say constitutes a church under the Constitution. And like I said, it seems reasonable to me. There do need to be standards. So for one, that these communities aren't just taking advantage of their members and their donations, which brings up another interesting subject about churches. They have to be a nonprofit. Now, there is an enormous discussion to be had around 501c3s, the typical nonprofit structure, or 508c1as as the original church structure, particularly among psychedelic churches, but we're not going to open that can of worms today, y'all. Bottom line is that despite having thousands of years of documented use as a religious sacrament, despite being proven in some of the most prestigious research universities to reliably produce a classical mystic experience, even when all of the rules of what an established church says or the, the IRS should look like, psychedelics, uh, and perhaps particularly psilocybin churches, are going to need to hold themselves to a different standard. 
the Catholic Church can run a nationwide international pedophilia ring, exist on a foundation of stolen gold and influence political decisions with impunity, but you, my mushroom practitioners, are going to document, need to document every gram of psilocybin that you consume in order to ensure that you are not locked behind bars. You must ensure that your mushrooms are locked behind bars. The last thing I will say before bidding you farewell for the episode is if you are starting, have started, or belong to any kind of psychedelic church, please be mindful that you are a pioneer. You are an exa Your example matters a great deal. Walk with integrity and sincerity. There is much work to be done in helping the general public gain confidence in our communities. The drug war gave psychedelic users a bad name. Let's work together to give authentic psychedelic spirituality the good name that it deserves. Won't you join me in welcoming GV? GV, welcome to Psilocybin Says, my friend. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I've been wanting to ask you for a while. Do you mind telling me what GV stands for? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, GV is short for Govindas. So it was a name offered to me in 2018 by Ramdas. So when I was studying with him in Hawaii in 2018, through a sort of a crazy series of events, I ended up sitting at a table with him and Raghu Marcus turns to Ram Das and says, Ram Das, this is Shane, he needs a new name. And uh, a short time later, I was offered the name Govind Das. So that is really my, wow. my root lineage is through Neem Karoli Baba and Ram Das. Oh, wow. What, do, what does that name signify? So Govinda is the earthly incarnation of the god Krishna. Uh, Krishna is the god of love. Uh, das is devotee. So Govinda Das is a devotee of Govinda or a devotee of Krishna. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, the more I get to know you, the more I like you, GB. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm full of surprises. <laughs> For so many good and bad things alike, I have uh, absolutely an open book. <laughs> that's one of the things I love to watch the most, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this uh, show. Uh, and also because you have such an extensive background in working in psychedelic churches. Uh, so we heard on the intro kind of some of what that's, what that's been like for you and, and how long you've been in this field uh, and with the Shala. But uh, to just jump right into our conversation about the nature of religion and psychedelic religions, I'd love to hear your definition of a church. What, what does church mean to you? Today, I would say that our church is made up of, it's made up of three things, I think. Uh, community is a huge piece of that. Um, experience, experience slash self-knowledge. So spirituality is the, the parent for our church. And I think that I think for me, church is spirituality, but it's a, a very different definition. So the definition of spirituality that I use is just self-knowledge. There is no dogma or doctrine required in church if we really focus on an individual's experience and learning about themselves. So I come from a traditional background in, in Advaita Vedanta, and we think of the self as the one unchanging element of our experience. And the self has three characteristics, Satchitananda, universal truth, uh, existence, and bliss. So really everything that I can do to learn about myself all points back to truth, consciousness, and bliss, um, or truth, existence, and bliss, rather. So I think that it's community. I think that it is experiential knowledge of the self, uh, spirituality. And then I think in our case, it is about the sacrament and the sacrament is the pathway. It's the rocket fuel that allows us to experience ourselves as the divine. Hmm. I appreciate your perspective of how did you say it, that spirituality 
is the church? How did how did you how did you relate those two? So our our the church's primary purpose, you might say, our church's statement of beliefs is spirituality or self knowledge through the use of our sacrament, which in our case is mushrooms. So it's just self knowledge because the self, if we believe the self is truly, if we are God, (laughs) if we are elements of the divine, then all we have to do is learn about ourselves and Mm. we fundamentally learn about the divine. Mm. Mm. What is your perspective around um, the idea of an eternal self? Do you have a belief that the self is eternal, as in like the little self? Um, That's something I've been exploring lately. I'm curious what you think there. So again, I go back to my teachings through Advaita Vedanta that the substratum of everything is what we would call the Brahman. Uh, The Brahman is the energy that makes up everything. And when I am incarnated into this body, I get a little piece of that Brahman that goes inside of me, which is called the Atman. The Atman lives inside, it's said to live inside of a little heart cave right in the middle of our chest called the Hridayam. So our version of our little uh, drop of the divine is called the self. It lives inside of us and it is unchanging. And then when this body dies, uh, in, in, in the Hindu tradition, we would say that we drop the body. Uh, when this body dies, our physical body dies, our pranic body dies, but our causal body moves to the next incarnation. And that version of the self, that permanent version of the self, continues until that seed is cooked. And once it's cooked, after millions, hundreds of millions of lives, we don't really know. But once it's cooked, it remerges with the Brahman. So, yeah, I do believe that it is unchanging. It is the only unchanging aspect of our experience. In fact, on my right wrist, I have a tattoo uh, in Sanskrit that's called Anitya. Um, And Anitya represents impermanence. Anything that I can experience in this body, in this life, is impermanent. So anytime you're having a really crappy day or a crappy process for a month or more, it's helpful to remember that it is impermanent. The flip side is also true. When I'm having a beautiful day or a beautiful process, it is also impermanent. It mm. will always go away. Mm-hmm. Mm. I had a uh, conversation with David Hodges. You know David Hodges? Um, he run, runs the uh, the Zydor Church out in uh, Oakland. I'm going to be interviewing him. A couple days here. I do know who you're talking about, but I don't yeah. know personally. Yeah. He asked me a really interesting question out in Denver last year um, that I have I've given thought to prior to the question, but maybe not as concentrated thought. And just the way that he asked and the timing, it really rang uh, pertinent to me. And that was what do I understand my soul's name to be like, or this Atman would I would it have a name? And after exploring that, I've come to a, a, a certain level of conclusion right now. And I'm curious, do you have a perspective on that for yourself? Have you thought about this? Maybe not thinking about it in terms of name, but just the, this Atman self, how do you, how do you, understand that aspect of what we see as GV. Yeah, my version of my the name I would would consider is really Dharma. Again, I'm going back to my tradition. So mm-hmm. this is not aligned with everybody, but Dharma is our purpose for being in this body. It's our it is the purpose that was divinely inspired. So every human that has a a soul, has the Atman, has a Dharma, your purpose in this body. And I think that that's what I would consider the name to be. Hmm. Uh, 
you know, one of the, the Dharma has so many different definitions. One of the simplest that I like is Dharma is the action that causes the least amount of suffering. So if I take actions every day that cause the least amount of suffering, then I am living a dharmic life. When I go outside of that, when I'm taking an action that causes suffering for myself or someone else, I'm living an adharmic life. And that causes, that is accumulating negative karma, which I then have to work through. On the other hand, if I'm living a, a dharmic life, I'm relieving myself of karma. And eventually when all of my karma has been burnt off, that's when I re-merge with the divine. What role do you understand the sacrament of sacred mushrooms playing in um, maybe burning off or helping to move through that? I, I don't have a great understanding of your tradition, uh, okay. but I'm appreciating conversation. And I've heard people say that mushrooms are karmic cleansers, right? And I'm just kind of curious what you're coming from this tradition and experience of mushrooms, how you interpret those kind of interface. So here's the beautiful thing about what you just said. My root tradition is Advaita Vedanta through um, Ram Das. And Ram Das was a, uh, sort of a spiritual dilettante. So he did Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and he, Sufism. He took whatever he could to, to proceed down his path. My medicine path is grounded in a lineage in Peru. Um, the maestro that I study with serves both Wachuma and Ayahuasca. And what I have learned through his teachings is just exactly what you said, is that these medicines are cleansing, they're purifying. So if we think of ourselves, here's the, a really kind of crude example that I like to think of. We are born and if we think of ourselves today as a Tootsie Pop, <laughs> very odd example, but in the center of that Tootsie Pop is this like perfect, soft, gooey Tootsie Roll. We always wanna get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. And when we're born, that's what we start with. But life kind of screws us up and it adds layer upon layer upon layer of hard candy shell. We go through puberty and we get like a half an inch of hard <laughs> candy shell. Like we break up with our partners. We have financial troubles. Work is really hard. Like all of the life's challenges add all of these layers of hard candy shell. Our goal as human beings in support of elevating our consciousness and the consciousness uh, of the, the world really is to relieve ourselves of as much hard candy shell as we can. <laughs> and meditation does it. It's sort of like sandpaper. MDMA might do it. And it's sort of like a ball peen hammer. Psilocybin and LSD I find are carpenter hammers. Ayahuasca, it's like a sledgehammer. Ibogaine, sort of a wrecking ball. <laughs> the bigger the tool, the more cleansing that we can do. But really what all of these substances do, I think, is that they liberate, transform, or transmute low energy, low vibration thoughts, beliefs, uh, somatic trauma, uh, in, in yoga, we would call it a samskara. In Buddhism, it would call it sam sankara. With all these low vibrations that are stuck inside of our system, the medicines help us relieve those. Uh, and they help us release or transmute it from negative to positive. One of my teachers says, the same energy that enter entered your body, the same vibration that entered your body does not have to leave your body in the same way. So it mm. can enter your body as anger and it can leave your body as forgiveness. Mm. That's what these medicines help us do. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Can, can you walk us through some of your life experience that brought you to this current path? I'm making a pretty broad assumption here, but, uh, 
I'm assuming that as a you know bald white man like myself, you didn't start out uh, practicing or uh, the teachings of Ram Das. That what what faith tradition did you were you birthed into and you know, can I share with some of the process of of you know coming out of that? Well, I grew up in a town of 700 people in the middle of central Nebraska. So the likelihood of me studying with Ram Dass and with a maestro <laughs> guru is pretty freaking low. Um, my parents never even mentioned God. Like, no, really? It's not that they were agnostic. It's not that they were atheist. It was just not a part of my experience growing up. Now, having said that, I... I used to go to Sunday school. I used to walk to the Methodist church as a little kid, like, I don't know, eight years old. I would like walk to church for Sunday school in the morning. And I don't know if it was kids in community or if I was just bored on a Sunday morning and I didn't want to be at home. I don't know. Hmm. That happened to me a number of times. When I was uh, 14, I got outed as a gay kid in high school and it was a really horrible experience. So this is probably hmm. the root trauma in a lot of ways. I, the next year, had the blessing, and I truly believe it was a blessing, that I was able to become a foreign exchange student. So I moved to Belgium when I was 15 years old, and I lived 11 months in Belgium. I spent my junior year in high school living with host families in a country that I didn't speak the language, but it was to escape the trauma of being outed. Wow. So I came back, I finished, while I was in Belgium, oddly enough, I bought BKS Iyengar's book, Light on Yoga. I, I had no idea what yoga was. I was 15 years old. I'm like, oh, yoga sounds interesting. And I tried to teach myself yoga from a book. Uh, it wasn't until 2012 that I actually found yoga. In 2013, I did my yoga teacher training. I guess to skip forward, Belgium started a 15-year cycle of abuse of substances, primarily alcohol, but there was also some drugs. I was a DJ for 15 years. I spent two and a half years as a DJ for Carnival Cruise Lines. Uh, I left the cruise ships, hmm. went back to Nebraska. The law enforcement in Nebraska decided that they didn't want me drinking and driving like I was on the cruise ships. So in 2007, I got sober. That then started a journey of self-realization. I spent uh, and I'm still an active member of 12-step recovery, but that program actually helped me start addressing some of the old shame and the trauma that I had been carrying around and with the cost of my drinking. Um, 2012, I found yoga. 2013, I did my yoga teacher training. I met a shaman, shamanic practitioner, just to be really specific there. I did work with her for a couple of years. That landed me in Peru, sitting with ayahuasca in 2015. And then in 2016, I really started, I invited uh, an ayahuascaro to come to St. Louis and we started building community around the medicine. I saw how powerfully healing it was for me. And for a number of years, I was bringing practitioners into St. Louis to serve the community. And in 2017, I started being asked to trip sit for people. Very, I want to use that term really, really specifically. I was not guiding. I was not helping people through their process. I was just holding space and keeping people safe and playing music. Uh, 2018, I met my first teacher, uh, an LSD teacher from San Francisco. Uh, 2019, I primarily shifted to mushrooms and then in 2021, we formed our church and started serving groups. Uh, and that's, that's where we're at today. We primarily focus on community and uh, group ceremonies. The group ceremonies are served in a very meditative way. We think of it as a, both an individual experience, but also you're doing it in a group. So it's no, in a lot of ways, it's no different than sitting in a meditation class for or going to a Vipassana course. You're doing your own work. You're just doing it in a group setting. There's, we honor noble silence. There's no touching. There's no talking. Uh, the facilitator, as a facilitator, I am really not interacting with participants outside of uh, on a need to basis. Hmm. So you're not coming out of any really strongly Western Christian or Judaic tradition at all. That's really interesting. No. So it, the, 
Go ahead. I was just going to say that the kind of capstone, I should have mentioned this, is in 2021, I ended up in Peru again, uh, being introduced to two brothers. And uh, one of those brothers has become the maestro that I study with today. He's uh, a definitive master. He has been given the permission to serve these medicines by the medicines themselves and has given me permission to serve the medicine here. Um, and I study with them pretty much exclusively now from a medicine path. I am definitely walking a, a path of Peruvian lineage, an unbroken lineage in Peru. So then how or why the focus on psilocybin and not ayahuasca? That's a great question. What we found in working with him is that they're all sort of the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I was sitting in Peru last November. It was actually the night that I was initiated into the lineage and Dr. Ayahuasca came to me and really presented the energy of the medicine came to me and showed me what it looked like. And I said, mm. ah, now I understand mm. like, this is, this is what I've been seeking. And then I said, ah, well, mm. Dr. Wachuma, like, please show yourself. And the, the energy of Wachuma came to me. And I, I said the same thing, Dr. Mushroom, like, are you willing to present yourself? And what I realized is that all of these medicines are just operating at a high vibration. They all fundamentally look the same mm. at an energetic level. Why I'm serving mushrooms? Because it's the most accessible medicine that we have here. And in some ways, I'm using my talents, my 15 years as a DJ, rather than singing traditional ikaros, I'm playing music to guide people through their experience in a, in a similar but different way. Mm. I'm using my talents. Now I am studying in the lineage to be able to serve one or both of those other medicines, but I have not been given permission yet to do that. And when it happens, it'll happen. If mm. it's supposed to happen, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, there's a lot that I could speak to there. I want to, um, but I don't, I, I'm going to want to refrain. Um, I really appreciate that perspective of the medicine itself presenting itself to you. And I, I can recall in my own experience, uh, when, when that happened, there was a, you know, a certain set of trials that, uh, were passed internally that eventually opened up that landscape. And, uh, the one weekend that I did work with ayahuasca it was pretty clearly presented to me that psilocybin is my home. It was nice to visit ayahuasca, uh, but yeah, the mushrooms are where my heart is, where my home is. So I, I, before we go into it, I think you've got to have such a unique perspective on what spirituality, what church, religious community, all these, these kind of like overlapping but somewhat distinct um, descriptors that we have for the the religious experience are but i can't i can't just gloss over you sharing um this experience of coming out or not even coming out of being brought out <laughs> yeah I mean, at 14. that's got to be such a such a formative experience and i'd just love to give you some space to talk about that if you're if you're willing you know, I will just say that that experience for me is on the surface, it might look different for everybody else. Like everybody, not everybody, but most people have some kind of experience that is really freaking hard. Mm -hmm. And all that shame and guilt and feeling like you've done something wrong gets stored. So that's what we would call a samskara in yoga. It's, it is stored in, in the yogic tradition. A samskara is an imprint that is stored in your heart. And uh, Buddhism would say that some samskaras are energy, heavy energy that are stored in your muscle fascia. Mm -hmm. And we all have them. Mm -hmm. And I carried around so much shame for so long and i'll be 
this is the first time I'm speaking publicly about this, but I will tell you, I've been sitting with medicine for a decade. This, I started a relationship, an emotional relationship as a fifth grader. I fell in love with someone as a fifth grader. And at that time, like there was no, it wasn't a sexual relationship by any means. Mm -hmm. It was just this, this deep friendship. And that friendship continued until I was 19 years old. And when I actually came out as a 19 year old, that friendship catastrophically ended. Mm. And I will tell you, like I continue to do my work. And three weeks ago in a personal journey that I was sitting with my own medicine, uh, having someone sit for me, I finally went back and realized that this was the origin wound of a lot of my attachment trauma, of my anxious, unorganized attachment, and frankly, my attachment towards unavailable men. (laughs) Hmm. Uh, So it's only been within the last three weeks that in some ways my life has completely changed. So for anybody that's out there listening and thinking like, oh, if I just do a one night of psilocybin <laughs> one journey, or if I just go and sit with ayahuasca one weekend in the jungle, then everything is going to be fine. Like mm. I've sat with Aya, I don't know, 50 plus times. I've sat with Wachumo, mushrooms, LSD, like very, very traditional and indigenous paths for many years now. Mm-hmm. And this is a step-by-step process. Mm-hmm. We are given as much as we can handle and we peel off the layers, we, we remove one little layer of hard candy shell. And then when we finally get the strength built up in our system, that's when the medicine says, okay, now it's time. Mm-hmm. Now you are strong enough that you can go back and do this work. Because mm-hmm. if you had to do that work, if 10 years ago, if somebody would have regressed me back to my f- fifth grade year or this really challenging childhood moment, I, it would have cracked me. It would have broken me. Mm -hmm. And the medicine is divinely intelligent. It is. It is. Yes. Yes. (laughs) It's, it's interesting. (laughs) How it's not uncommon, particularly when working with someone who is new to these medicines um, for individuals to express I want to say um, a to express a belief that they are wiser than the medicine <laughs> yeah <it's, laughs> you probably you've probably seen that right <laughs> hey, I I have been guilty of it myself. oh not me not me no uh, when I <laughs> when I started when I started, I really thought that I was the bee's knees. Like I thought that I was the one who was supposed to be guiding the ceremony. And today I know I don't, I don't even like the term guide. I, it's the term that is used frequently. So I, I I'm okay being called that, but I like the term of spotter. I like a guide walks in front of you and says, I know the way, follow me, come this way. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of being a spotter and we, we, put our, our congregants safely into a harness and we say, start climbing the mountain. You got this mountain to climb. You can climb it any way you want to. I'm going to stand on the ground. I'm going to hold the rope. I'm going to allow you to start climbing. And if you get stuck, just wave your hand. And I will tell you like, hey, reach your left hand up at nine o'clock. There's a handhold there. Hmm. And if you slip and fall, you might slip and fall and you might fall far enough that you're going to bang against the side of the mountain. And it's going to be like, it might leave a couple of scrapes. You might leave this with a bruise, but I guarantee you that you're not going to fall all the way down. I will catch you before you fall all the way down, but I'm the finger pointing at the moon. I am not the moon and you shouldn't look at my finger and mistake it for the moon. Uh, All I'm doing is just, uh, pointing you in the right direction when you ask for it. Because I do believe in this world, in the 
topic, we talk about the inner healing intelligence or the inner healer. And I believe that's true. And my tradition, I think I would call it the Atman. It is the soul. It is our soul that is divinely attuned for peace, joy, and freedom. And if I just let it do its work, it knows way faster how to get this work done than I do. Mm -hmm. Amen. I love that, that metaphor of the spotter, the analogy. That's, that's really good. I may, uh, I may borrow that from you. <laughs> and I, I'd like to also share with you that, um, you know, I was kind of reflecting on my, my own journey. This is, uh, this year is 25 years. This fall will be 25 years that I've been working with mushroom. Wow. Um, and I was kind of reflecting on <clears throat> how that has impacted my just worldview, my, my spiritual practice, my relationships with other human beings. And, you know, I was also born in a town of about 700 uh, here in Kentucky. And when I moved to the big city of Louisville, uh, I met my first gay man. I saw the first interracial, quote, interracial couple. And I can remember a certain point where after intentionally and actively reprogramming my beliefs, starting with um, kind of mixed ethnicity relationships. I mean, it was a very racist town that I grew up in. I was a racist child. You know, that's what I was, was the garden that I grew in. And um, I can remember a time where I was waiting tables and I was waiting on a, a black and white couple. And it was like a half an hour into their dining experience that I was like, oh, I didn't even notice. They're two different colors. That's cool. And the other day when we were texting each other, we've known each other for what, a year and a half, maybe two years okay. now. Years now. Like yeah. And when you messaged me about a guy you were dating, I was like, I, I did it. That was the first time. It was a very similar experience that like an hour or two hours later, I was like, oh, wow. I didn't even realize GB was gay. <laughs> that, so like it, it, which was, it was, it was really, as I continue to try and assess my, my growth, my perspectives, um, that was really, it was really valuable for me personally, anyway, um, to, to be able to see that that's like, I think that that's fully no longer mm. baggage that I carry, you know, um, which is evidence of spiritual progress. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I appreciate that lesson from you. You know, there's a, I have started to use the David Hawkins map of consciousness. Oh my God. I love that guy. I got two of his <laughs> books right there beside me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was just thinking, so acceptance, I think is like mid three, like three fifty. I think is acceptance. Mm -hmm. So, as we increase in our level of consciousness, these things, we don't even have to think about them anymore. Once we, right. it's a challenge to break through to that next level. Mm -hmm. But once you have escalated beyond that, it becomes a lot easier to accept. And this, like the map of consciousness aligns really well with the idea of purification or cleansing mm -hmm. that the medicine does mm -hmm. is that, these things, in my opinion, these substances vibrate at a level that is near pure enlightenment. It mm -hmm. is vibrating at a thousand. And when we ingest these substances, they go into our body. Ayahuasca is the most powerful one because we ingest this and it's like it is the vine moving through our system. And we can literally feel Dr. Ayahuasca touching these parts. You talked about a trial that you went through. And when I was in the jungle the last time, the medicine came to me on the third night and said, it's your choice now. You have to make a choice. Do you want to move forward in this path or do you want to turn around? Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I had been warned that mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. question could be asked of me. And mm -hmm. I said, 
yes, I'm ready to move forward. And the medicine came in and said, oh, not with that, you're not. Hmm. And like this started a two hour purge. Like hmm. I, I would get asked the question, are you still ready to move forward? And the medicine would come in and find some thought, some belief, some heavy hmm. energy. And I would throw that up hmm. and we do it again and again and again. And each one of these helps me lighten my load. It helps me remove some of that hard candy shell. And with each one, I move slowly up that map of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I can look at, I can take Advaita Vedanta. I can take Peruvian shamanism. I can take David Hawkins' map of consciousness. I can take somatic psychotherapy, traditional psychodynamic therapy, and even stuff from Robin Carhart Harris and what he's talking about, what's happening in the brain. And it all makes sense. Actually, I'm, I have a, I, I auditioned for a TED Talk last weekend to present a unified theory of psychedelic healing and that basically talks about this from an energetic through the map of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lens of Taoism works really well for me in understanding the energetics and how it relates to the consciousness level. That's And, and David Hawkins, man, I, th I think if there's anybody who is like a, a a modern hero to me, that guy. I, I just love his laugh, the way he talks, the way he communicates. Oh, my God, I love David Hawkins. Anyway, all right, so let's talk about spirituality, religion, <laughs> church, religious communities. You're coming out of a, a framework that seems to me anyway to be very different from a Western spiritual religious community and yet you are leading this kind of um mm, sort of western religious community I mean, how would you how do you describe your community through eastern terminology and philosophy okay so, uh, in buddhism it would be called the in hinduism it would be called the satsang in Buddhism, it's called the, um, it's the Sangha. I might have those reversed. But it is an intentional spiritual community of people coming together and intentionally doing their work together. The satsang allows people to show up as their whole selves, the broken parts and all. And we accept that we're going to trigger each other. Reactivity is the path to healing that Amen. when someone triggers me, it triggers something inside of me and I might feel anger. Well, my teacher in Peru would say, can you thank them <laughs> for triggering you because they're showing you that it's your, that you have anger within mm -hmm. and then it's your job to get rid of the anger. Mm. So, that is really what intentional community is all about. We don't need any dogma or doctrine to trigger each other. We can just show up and be human beings. And the beautiful thing about, so we call ourselves the church of universal consciousness. And it's, we allow people to use whatever path they want to work through that reactivity. So if it's Taoist, if it's Buddhist, if it's Hindu, if it's, um, Christian, like, I don't particularly care what path you choose to resolve your trauma. And that could be just psychotherapy or somatic therapy. I don't care what path you choose to release yourself of that reactivity. What we are here together as a group is to show up and not only be reactive around each other, go back to our individual corners, do our work, and then come back to the community and say, I understand more about myself. I understand more about you. Like, how can we be in relationship, healthy relationship together now that we have done some of our own healing? So I think that we, we have a religious community, but it's really a spiritual community and religion happens in a specific place. Spirituality can happen anywhere. Religion is a group activity. Spirituality is an individual activity. Religion has dogma and doctrine. Spirituality is just about self-knowledge and experience. 
So there are some really key differences when we look through an Eastern lens that separate traditional Western religion and spirituality. Mm. How do you draw a comparison between church and spiritual community? Or do you? I think it's the same thing. Okay. Right now, it tends to be the way the U.S. government <laughs> needs us to, to talk about it, to, to frame it. I think that we are doing absolutely deep spiritual work. The religion is baked into the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. It doesn't say the Spiritual Freedom and Restoration Act right. because our First Amendment doesn't guarantee our spirituality, but it guarantees our religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that they're the same. It mm -hmm. just happens to be a word that we need to use today. Right, right. Are you familiar with the IRS's 15-point guidelines to a, what a church is? Yeah, is it? eight or 15. I can't remember that. It's 15. Yeah. Do, do you, how do you, how do you intersect with those? Do you even take that into consideration? What are, what's your perspective on those guidelines? I think we have to, as a, as a church attempting to operate within the bounds of this society, of this law and tax system, we do have to honor those. So we do our best to honor as many of those as we can. We have the distinct advantage of being connected to a lineage in Peru, an unbroken lineage in Peru. Now, the medicine is different, mm -hmm. but the energy is the same. Now, whether we could prove that in a court of law, uh, I hope that we never have to come to that point. But I do believe that I could have the maestro that I study with come and stand up in a in testifying court. And he would absolutely be able to demonstrate how the lineage is intact mm -hmm. the way that we are serving medicine. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, an interesting scenario we find ourselves in that the IRS is who defines what a religious organization is. Yes, I would, uh, <laughs> I would tend to agree with that. And, you know, I, I think that there's... Who was it? Uh, Michael Pollan. I think we were actually sitting. We might have been sitting in Denver listening to this talk together. Yeah, you're right. Pollan and uh, Richards. Uh, yeah. And he said, there's a couple of kinds of churches. <laughs> there's, a, there's a church <laughs> that is really interested in creating community and helping people heal and grow. Mm -hmm. And then there's a church that is really using a 501c3 as a front to sell, to, to make money, to profit mm -hmm. through this, the sale of substances and what I see more often than not now, training. I see yeah, a lot of yeah. church, um, training guides mm -hmm. uh, and really it's just a front for a LLC. Mm -hmm. um, so we have really, really tried to be the former, um, not the latter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, you bring up some, some painful subjects there, which kind of dovetails pretty well into the, the next kind of aspect of this that I wanted to explore, and that is <sighs> nurturing faith in a culture that has so much religious trauma. And a lot of that religious trauma is rooted in being a commodity for the churches, right? The, the membership, the parishioners are purely a commodity. Um, and we're seeing some of that happen in psychedelic churches. It's maybe not as apparent because there is still this kind of newness to psychedelics. And there's a lot of people that want to be, you know, psychedelic therapists or facilitators. And so this seems like an, an easy pathway to do so. And you and I both know that probably 25% of those people who go through those trainings are actually going to go on long term to serve medicine, if even that. Uh, but that aside, how are how are you experiencing in your membership um, kind of recovery from trauma, the religious trauma, and then well, we'll put a pin in. I got another one after that, but just start there. 
I think that because we approach this from a very experiential path, I don't, our church, not, there's no I really, our church does not require anyone to believe in a specific set of dogma or doctrine mm -hmm. and that we do operate on some pretty clear core values spirituality and by spirituality i mean it's a very individual activity it's self-knowledge and that leads us into the to being very experiential that you, and i tell people all the time you have to believe nothing of what i say i might be able to offer you something and you can choose to believe that or not but what i would prefer you to do is listen to it go out and test it for yourself have your own personal experience and then if it works for you great Keep it. If it doesn't, pitch it. Um, stability, uh, reciprocity, all really core, core values of the church. And we really require or ask people to believe in the core values and operate under those core values more so than any specific set of dogma or doctrine. Mm -hmm. Um so that's one way we really lift the covers off of the traditional Western models and mm -hmm. people find it to be pretty refreshing. They're like, Oh, you mean I don't, you're not going to make me put $5 in the pan when it goes by. Uh, we do ask people to, to donate to the church for their ceremonies. And should people want to make a donation after that? We don't even ask for donations. If people feel called to donate at some point in time, they're welcome to do that. We've just taken a lot of the aspects of Western religion that have harmed people, and we've gotten rid of it. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot more freedom and flexibility. Mm -hmm. And people can feel it. When you, Ram Das talks about... Uh, being in relationship with someone. And if I want something from you, maybe it's, maybe it's as subtle as I would really like Eric to just pay me a compliment of some kind today. And if I, if that is inside of me, if that desire is inside of me, that subtle desire shows up in your system and you experience just a tiny little bit of paranoia, like, mm, GV wants something from me. I don't exactly know what it is, but I can feel that he wants something. It's the same feeling that we get when we walk onto a car lot. <laughs> I, I worked for an auto dealer for two and a half years, and I, and I love uh, all of you car salesmen. Don't take it the wrong way. But, and, and it's whether it's a car lot, whether it's you walking into a, to, to Best Buy, to the electronic section or like the, the home theater section and some salesperson walks up to you. What do we want to do? We want them to go away. We want to walk away because we know that they're going to take something from us that we want. Mm -hmm. And at the relationship level, it can be as, just as subtle as wanting something like a compliment. And if you feel that I want something from you, you're going to take a step back. You have that little paranoia that I want something that you don't, you might not want to give. And when you, as a facilitator, as a church uh, minister, as someone who is organizing community, if you can be as clean as possible and not actually want anything mm. from your congregants, they have no paranoia of saying, oh, what's this guy trying to take from me? Mm -hmm. So I would say the only way that we get to do that is by showing up and doing our work mm. um, and not needing it. There's one of my mentors says, if you think that you're supposed to serve psychedelics, you shouldn't be. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if I need you, if I am the healer, then I need someone to heal. Mm. I need someone who's broken to show up so I can heal them. But mm. if I let go of my role as the healer and simply show up as who I am without needing anything from you, and if you want to show up and just do this work, great. 
then I don't need anything from you and you don't need to give me anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man. I really appreciate that. And I, I, I suspect that is why I have always felt so comfortable. You know, even when you drove here from St. Louis that first time, it's, it's these days, it's not super often that I'm just like, sure, I'll hang out with you for two hours, somebody that I don't know, because my experience has been so much that there is an unspoken desire, some some want that is beneath the surface. And I, I really I sincerely never felt that with you. Uh, so I, I appreciate you mentioning that. And, and it also speaks to why I probably have such a kind of a, a cringy response whenever someone calls themselves a healer. And I don't think that there is a conscious desire to prey on anyone at all. I think it genuinely, for most folks, comes from a, a sincere desire uh, to, to help. But it requires that, that kind of codependent relationship. It's interesting. I I used to cringe at the word healer as well until I changed my definition. And now I think that a healer, much like a surgeon, a surgeon cuts you open. And at the end, that surgeon takes a fine piece of thread and brings two pieces of skin close enough together that the body can heal itself. Mm. And as a healer, I, I think of myself only as the thread, only as the stitches in the process. Mm. I'm not doing anything except facilitating or increasing the likelihood of your body mm -hmm. being healed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can get that. It's all about definitions. Uh, I yeah. find a good old Bashar has taught me that and uh yeah so there's a lot of value in changing those definitions so but in inside of this larger culture context where we have uh so much religious trauma how how do you find yourself navigating the conversation around being a church facilitator a church leader uh, maybe outside of your congregants or your uh, membership is that even a conversation that you have? Not really. No. The only time I really talk about it is when someone brings it up. Mm -hmm. And it, one in 20 conversations, maybe, the, the concept of church really comes up. I've had people later, after they have been a part of the church, come up to me and say, I never thought that I would be a part of a church like after my childhood years, after catechism, I never thought that I would be a part of a church again. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that this is where I landed. Like this is my kind of church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like, I don't, I, don't, I hesitate to say responsibility. Um, role is maybe a better word. Um, what, if any role do you feel like yourself and or your church is playing to to reframe our understanding of church and religion in this country i think that if we look at religion and if we look at like global spirituality i hate to use the words but i'm going to say the love and light brigade there's a lot of talk about healing the collective conscious. Like mm -hmm. we just need to raise the vibration of everyone. I don't, I don't actually agree with that. I, Ram Das would say, the only thing that I can do for you is work on myself. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you can do for me is work on yourself. Mm -hmm. We keep things really, really focused on the self. And what we do as the church is we help people come in and heal themselves and then they go back out into the world <clears throat> and they help heal other people or they they don't even help heal other people they show up in a different way that want that makes other people want to themselves heal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
when when a partner comes in and has a really powerful transformational experience and become and raises their level of consciousness is a generally a happier person then that the, the partner their partner says well wow how did you do that this mm-hmm. comes from alcoholics anonymous like the big book of aa says we're a program of attraction rather than promotion churches today traditional western churches are far more about promotion <laughs> yes. than they are about attraction. So we there we do no advertising. This is probably the most I'm talking about the church in the, the two years that we've been in mm-hmm. in existence. But we I do not believe in promoting. The the thing with promotion is that if I ask somebody to come be a member of our church, I put them in a position to have to say no. And most people don't like saying no, Hmm. especially in Western culture. Most people don't have the the, uh, level of consciousness or self-awareness to to disappoint someone because if they say no, then they're gonna disappoint me and maybe I'm their friend. So I've just learned never to ask because if I don't ask, then they don't have to say no. But if Hmm. they feel called and they see the results of people that are coming out of our church and they see the community and they want to be a part of that, they'll come based on attraction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So surely the people, no matter what you do to establish this kind of um, foundation of spiritual liberation it feels like of uh creative spiritual license you're still dealing with people that are coming in from a majoritively christian probably western history and that has for the known history has been a very top-down dogmatic experience Psychedelics them are are almost the inverse because it is the direct experience that informs your spiritual practice and spiritual growth. It has seemed to me so far that there is a certain percentage of individuals who, despite consciously running from Western religion, acknowledging religious trauma, are still kind of programmed to seek that um, disbursement of knowledge. They want someone to be their guru, their priest, their leader. How do you work within that space? You're obviously, that's not how you operate, but when you come up against that ideology that lifestyle like how do you interface with that and redirect it i can't i i think i i think i've never been asked this question before but i'm gonna try and think through this for a moment Mm -hmm. i think that i've taken a page from ram das's playbook here and for years he showed up and talked about his life and his work he said towards the when the nineties, even he said, I've been doing this work for 30 years and none of my neuroses have ever gone away. They've only gotten softer. And he talked about his work and he talks about how challenging life can still be. And I think that's one of the ways that I pull back the veil is I share with people that I am equally as screwed up as a human being as everybody else is. So any potential of believing that I am some enlightened guru uh, is quickly dissipated by that. I also think that spirituality can be sort of sweet and easy. I think that spirituality doesn't have to be super serious. I will say the F bomb and I will use the word shit on occasion and I am not a holier than thou human being that stands on 
the mount and tells people what they need to feel. So I think part of it is just being me, being real. Um, I also, we use the Bhagavad Gita as what I might consider our source text. And I love the Bhagavad Gita primarily because of its focus on non-dual philosophy. So Christianity is a dualistic tradition. I am me, God is God, and the only time that we're going to meet is when I die and I go to heaven. We focus on a non-dual philosophy, which aligns really well with psychedelics. Uh, when you talk about ego disillusion and the default mode network, and when all of those things go offline and I merge into greater consciousness, that's fundamentally what Advaita Vedanta is. Uh, so everything that we orient towards says that each of us are our own guru uh, and that you don't need me uh, to be that, mm -hmm. to fill in that role. So I think it has to, it is a conscious choice that I often try and step out of. I love that. Yeah, right there with you. And I suspect that that has its own set of challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a book that here's a here's a shortcut. I'll give everybody a little shortcut for enlightenment, or maybe the lack thereof. There's a book, <laughs> there's a book uh, called "If You Meet the Buddha on the Side of the Road, Kill Him." Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, that I learned very early on in my Vedantic studies was that any time you hear somebody say the word "I." I have this, I'm doing this, I am this. That person is automatically, we know is not enlightened because mm -hmm. there is a subject object relationship between them and the thing that they want to do or become. Mm -hmm. Literally the word I is a way to, if somebody says that they are enlightened and they still use the word I run mm -hmm. the other direction. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that people still project this onto us. And we have to be doing, as church ministers, as facilitators of this work, we have to be doing our work. We have to be in a peer facilitation group. We have to have a supervisor. We have to be in community. We have to have some kind of accountability structure around us who's not afraid to call us on our shit because it happens. Mm -hmm. And we can, I can get triggered by my community members just like anyone else can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how 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 are you navigating that how are you working with it this is this is a currently a bit of a challenge for me right now and i'm curious how when it comes up for you how do you reconcile those relationships if so how do you yeah well first of all it's messy mm -hmm. uh, and i'm realizing this that I'm assuming that when you go to seminary, they teach ethical boundaries and they stress the importance of non-dual relationships in that type of educational structure. And most of us growing up in the psychedelic world do not have that type of training. So I think that we do what feels good and what we think is the most beneficial to our congregants and what that has meant for me. And I don't know what it's meant for you, but for me, it's, I spent the better part of the last two years trying to figure out what my boundaries were. Cause I realized early on that I shouldn't be doing my own work inside of the community. Last year, I spent the better part of the year trying to figure out how to be friends, how to not do my own work, but still how to be friends with my community members, but still also try and be the minister. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized very recently is that doesn't work very well either. <laughs> uh, the dual role nature of that has caused jealousy in the community. It's caused confusion in the community. Uh, and it's caused a fundamental lack of safety for me and potentially for other community members. So what I have done now 
is begun to separate my person, won't completely separate my personal relationships from my congregants. Not my congregants, I'm sorry, from the congregants, from the, the congregants of the church. Mm-hmm. And it's been an uncomfortable learning process and it will continue to be an uncomfortable separation but I feel like it's the safest path for me and the people involved in the church. I'm really curious how that will evolve, at least in for, for my experience, the overwhelming majority of my personal friends have also come and join Sanctuary. Um, and I'm not friends with anybody that isn't psychedelic friendly, like that's just period. So I'm curious, like for yourself, I would imagine there's a lot of crossover there. How do you, how do you see this playing out? I mean, do you feel like you will long-term continue to be a leader in the church? And I've just, and of of course you don't know, but like, what's your, what's your vision for this as, as you look at it? I don't know. And I, am not responsible for the outcome. I'm responsible for doing the best I can for myself and the community and letting God take care of the results. To your point, yes, 90%, if not more, of my friend base is also a part of both the church and or the Shala, our spiritual community center. So it leaves a big gap right now in my existence and it's forcing me to go seek healthy, safe relationships elsewhere. Not easy, Mm -hmm. but I think that it generally is safer for everyone involved. And because safety is our second core value that only under spirituality It's what I have to do as the lead minister of this church. I have to prioritize the church over my own personal needs. So that's what I'm trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. I I hope you don't mind me asking this question um, and feel free to pass on it. But are there reverberations of that childhood trauma that are playing out in this scenario. And I don't mean, are you uh, re-embodying that trauma, but are you revisiting that trauma through this experience? (laughs) Uh, This is a very good question. I remember asking you a question on my podcast and you stopped and said, Mm -hmm. only person who's ever asked me that question. (laughs) And I think that I just got uh, my, uh, my, sacred reciprocity. (laughs) Um, Yes. All of those old attachment buttons, all of this stuff is coming to a head in so many ways. And I'm having to do some of the deepest work I have ever done in relation to relationships how I show up for myself, how I like create safety within myself and how I have abdicated some of that safety to other people. And then having that safety and trust broken and that sent me back, sort of rocked me back on my heels. And now I, fortunately I have a beautiful maestro in Peru and, and, therapist and a supervisor and I sort of called the, like I've called the team together and we're figuring this out. Uh, It'll make me a better, stronger person in the end. But yeah, it is, this is all relevant. I have found myself in a position that requires me to do my deepest work. This is causing more reactivity in my system than almost anything has in the past Mm -hmm. decade. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you. 
I will be a safer, stronger, um, more reliable human being as a result of doing this work, which will eventually create stronger community as well. It's at least what I think. It's what I've made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I just, on a personal level, you know, um, I, w I want you to have that community too. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a conundrum that I'm finding myself in. I'm not ready to kind of um, depart from that relationship at this time, and I'm I don't I don't know how it will unfold. But uh, the work that you're doing, your experience is certainly relevant to mine, and I, I appreciate how transparent you've been for over the last couple of years as we've, you know, expanded our conversation, um, both privately and publicly, you've been, yeah, an open book, like it's, you said. Uh, it's really challenging because there are, there's not, again, as we are trying to build something new without all the training, like the clergy goes through multiple years of teachings, not only in their doc, dogma and doctrine, but they're given practical training on how to show up inside of their congregation. And there's a lot of us that are really trying to do important work inside of the psychedelic community through the church lens and we don't have all the training that other people might. So I guess if, if there's a somebody out there listening, here is one of the things that I have asked five or six of my community members just in the past two, three weeks. If you're out there listening and you are part of a church, considering a church, or just part of a spiritual community, and you feel like something is out of alignment, whether it's true, whether it's rumor, whether there's just something that doesn't feel right. One of the most powerful thing, one of the, the things I think that differentiates successful people than non-successful people is the ability to have a hard conversation. And I have found that this some of the issues that come up inside of spiritual communities could all be avoided with a simple, hard conversation. And most of the time, the conversations aren't even as hard as we think they are. They just feel hard from the outside. So if you have a concern, try and keep this in mind. That the person that you might be thinking of is probably doing the best they can with what they've got. They probably don't have all the training that other people in their positions would have in large church ecosystems. And please, for heaven's sake, just go have a conversation. Amen. Amen. There's these months and months of suspicion, yeah. whisperings. It's, uh, God, it's, I don't know if there's anything that is more unhealthy for a community than that. And people like you and I are genuinely trying to do our best. And we don't even know what's happening like, under the covers mm -hmm. sometimes. And mm -hmm. we're just trying to show up and create a safe, effective container for people to do their work. And the amount of projection and turmoil that get kind of splashed back onto us is pretty mm -hmm. significant. It's not the easiest chair to sit in. Out of I spent 20 plus years in corporate America working with tech companies and companies large and small. And this is by all means the lowest I've gotten paid and the most drama, pain, and suffering that I've ever experienced. So <laughs> the equation oh. doesn't work very well. That feels so good to hear, though, honestly, uh, because that is so much of my experience as of late. So it's uh, always good to have some uh, 
professional com- yeah, commiseration, exactly. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last thing I want to touch on, we we, we spoke out a little bit about, about this before we started recording, is this um, weird world of indigenous adoption, appropriation, idealism as it interfaces with modern psychedelia and in particular the churches. You've got a very unique perspective. You are in Peru quite often studying with maestros. You're here starting a, you know, North American psychedelic church. How do we bring these worlds together in a really, uh, in a respectful, in a, in, a, in a way that is really full of integrity and is authentically honoring the traditions and perspectives and not just lip service and, you know, uh, yeah, leave it there. You are. I thought we were home free, but you are absolutely. <laughs> you are absolutely going to get me in trouble now. <laughs> uh, My goal is to get us yeah. both canceled, G. <laughs> well, let me let me first just say that I have uh, set with within three traditions only in Peru. So I am by no means representative of indigenous wisdom in North America, Native American traditions. I I don't have any experience there. I don't have experience in Colombia or Bolivia or any of that. I have experience in Wachuma and Ayahuasca. I don't understand Ibogaine and what is happen- what's happening with the Buiti tribe. So I can only speak from my personal experience. I am involved in a fair number of communities, mostly online communities, and we, as we saw at MAPS in the final session, the closing remarks, there was a lot of grumbling about not honoring indigenous communities. And I, my experience here is that we have a really interesting, most Westerners have a very interesting experience or like projection of what indigenous communities really look like. I, I, I think that we've, we have this 1950s Maria Sabina in a little hut and untouched by Western culture uh, or mm-hmm. people living in the jungle. Uh, and you go see this like crazy shaman who's dressed in crazy garb and all of this like indigenous ornaments around. And that has not been my experience in any of the indigenous traditions that I've ever set with the maestros that I set with now wear sweatpants and tennis shoes and like a pullover jumper when they're serving ayahuasca. They don't have, they, we have a very specific cross that is a part of the lineage that is offered protection, but it's like, they don't wear special clothing uh, when they serve ayahuasca. It's completely unimportant. Uh, I think that indigenous traditions are often given a lot of lip service and said that we need to honor the indigenous traditions. But the problem then is when the indigenous come in and they actually say like, here's the way that you should serve psychedelics or you shouldn't serve psychedelics or here is the wisdom and how we would approach this specific issue. Most Westerners will say, "Mm." really like that that's not how it works here Mm -hmm. so it's i find that so many people without true lived experience receiving medicine in indigenous traditions sort of it's like slot machine indigenous wisdom like you put a quarter in the slot machine you pull the handle you get your answer and if you like it great you use that if you don't like it then you go somewhere else Mm-hmm. So how do we incorporate it ethically? I think that if you really want to honor indigenous traditions, you should get your ass to Peru or Bolivia or Mexico, and you should sit with in truly indigenous medicine carrier. Because everything that gets repeated, it's like an echo chamber of honoring indigenous wisdom, but really mm-hmm. no one, very few people know what, indigenous wisdom is today until you actually go down and experience it. Um, So yeah, go take your money down to Peru. Maria Sabina, like this, again, this romanticized idea of, you know, Haka and and Maria Sabina and these shamans, like she was statues of Mary and Jesus all around. 
Now, very Catholic. She was a practicing Catholic as well as an active curandera. So uh, we absolutely have a, a skewed perspective. Uh, I guess one of the things that I've been starting to talk about, I've, I've, I've internally worked under this model for quite a while, uh, but only recently, kind of after that MAPS fiasco, um, have I really become more vocal about this. Is I, I have a belief that we are the indigenous. We are, I, I often say the new indigenous or however you want to term it, but like, this is where I was born. This is what I understand through my lived experience, and this is what I practice. Can we learn from cultures that have worked with these medicines and adopt some of that wisdom? Absolutely. Similarly to how Maria Sabina or, you know, and, uh, and Huatla de Menez adopted Christianity or Catholicism in ways, right? So this idea that, like, everything is appropriation. I don't know anything that exists that has not been some form of appropriation. Uh, so it it is a it's an interesting place that we find ourselves in, um, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to to really create something that is a beautiful amalgamation of various traditions. And I don't really I don't personally have a problem with people, you know, cherry picking what they want to take out of any practice as long as there's not this kind of broad lip service that you must honor indigenous cultures, all indigenous cultures and all of their practices. Meanwhile, you are negating or cherry picking, right? So like to just to just value what you value, to whatever resonates or whatever feels right with you. Move through it. Adopt it for a while. You may find yourself that one day it doesn't fit anymore and you don't have to wear that hat any longer. Mushrooms have grown all over the world and people have been using them in every continent. Uh, or maybe not every continent, almost every continent. And I agree with you. I think that there is a group of people that are becoming the new elders of these medicines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I served mushrooms sort of in my own way through the guiding of a couple of teachers that were very westernized teachers that had no indigenous roots. And I had served mushrooms for years under their tutelage, but there was no indigenous connection. Therefore, in my opinion, I don't need to pay homage to Maria Sabina and Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. It never even mm -hmm. occurred to me. Now, today, it's different. Today, I, I am in a lineage, and I do honor my teachers in a very specific way, and I take guidance from them. And there is sacred reciprocity, but in our relationships, uh, that, it, that comes out in many different ways. Um, it's not just a financial exchange that we need to be mm -hmm. giving giving back. That is a part of it. Absolutely. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with you that not everything has to be indigenous. And I think that there is perfectly valid use cases for serving psilocybin in a doctor's office. It has mm -hmm. no for indigenous sure. connection. It can be extremely clinical, but that might be what someone needs to start them on their path. I'm just fine yep. with that. And it can come in a pill. It doesn't have to come in the form mm -hmm. of a mushroom. Oh. Cognitive yeah. liberty, baby. I'm all for you do what is right for you. All right. Last question. It's the easy one. Everybody gets it. What does psilocybin say to you, GV? And that can be, maybe it's just today. Maybe there's a, a bigger message. All the medicines say peace, joy, and freedom. Hmm. that's what we're here for and if you're not if you've given up on the possibility of a life with peace, joy and freedom 
uh, in some ways I feel sorry for you, but if you're listening to this right now and you've given up on that, uh, see if you can muster up a little more courage and do a little more work because it is within you. Hmm. Yes. Yes. It's always there. It's, it's actually the foundation. All the things that don't look like peace, joy, and freedom, they're on that foundation, whether we realize it or not. You're, I love, Bashar says, I love, I don't know if you know Bashar, but he is this guy. I listened to a teacher of mine. He says that, uh, you know, you are, the universe loves you so much that it allows you the free will to suffer. It allows you the free will to think that your life is horrible. And wow, the freedom to suffer <laughs> or to not. If it were not through the suffering. So Ram Dass says all suffering is grace. So when I realize that that person in my community is triggering me and showing me where my anger or resentment is, that when I realize that they're giving me a gift to show me where my anger is, mm. that what I thought was suffering now becomes grace because now it's an opportunity mm. for me to go and do my own work, to, to release that, to let that go, to work through it, to unpack it in whatever way I want to. So, yeah, we have the, the freedom to suffer or to be joyous as much as we want. Amen. GV, I love you, brother. It's really great to know you. Thanks for the opportunity. Great.